If you will listen to the next hour, you will get a master class in leadership, in team building, in life lessons, in relating to human beings, whether you are a manager or an employee, whether you're the boss or just the worker, this woman is amazing. And I really hope you enjoy it. I'm a big believer that performance is about 80% mental. If we train our minds as much as we train our bodies, it shows up in your performance. What is the sound of one man listening? This is Man Listening, a fresh podcast featuring the stories of strong women who bounce back. Man Listening, because every woman deserves to be heard. Hi, I'm Stuart Watson, and welcome to Man Listening. Boy, are you about to just get a tour de force, just an incredible amount of wisdom. This woman is the winningest coach in the history of the Ivy League, and chances are you've never heard of her. I can only think if she were a man, she would be teaching regularly at Harvard undergrad in the business school. She's writing a book about everything she's learned. She has been coaching for four decades as the principal women's basketball coach at Harvard. And for five decades overall, she never really played the game at the collegiate level. She never really studied physical education in high school, and she has seen a mountain of change. And all of the lessons that she talks about are applicable if you hate sports and hate basketball and hate women's basketball. So even if you're a hater, stay tuned because she is amazing. Kathy Delaney Smith. Where were you born? I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. You'll be able to tell as soon as you ask me to say something with an R R in it. For your mother, you were number one of how many? Five of six. Oh. And her favorite. (laughs) And her favorite. Is that true? No, it's not true. Well, I always grew up thinking it was true, but then my sisters and I would have like this sister's reunion and come to find out all the things she did for them. I learned real quickly that that was a little fantasy I had, that I was her favorite, but I I don't think she had a favorite. But she, I might have been her favorite because I'm a coach and she was a coach, so. What, what did she coach? Basketball. Yeah, Women's she was basketball. a woman ahead of her time, way ahead. Six player, you know, not basketball as we know it. You, you're too young, Stuart, to see, but it was six player, we couldn't dribble three on each side. That that basketball. Oh, that was that the that wasn't the men's game. That was the women's game. Mm-hmm. That was the women's right. game. Yeah, that we fought tooth and nail to get rid of because they didn't want any woman or girl running the length of the court because that would ruin her chances of ever having a child. That was the that was the thought behind letting women run. Were yeah. they serious? Yes, they were serious. I know. Yes, they were serious. That was what we were told. So, um, and, and so when they changed the rules, they only um, let one, de- one designated player could be the rover. Actually, no, two. So out of the six players, two were called rovers, and they could run back and forth both ends, and they could be on defense and on offense. Then there were two permanent defensive players and two permanent offensive players. It was very bad. It wasn't wasn't good. Did you ever play for your mother? Did she ever coach you? Yes. Yes. She did coach me. And the joke is, so I did score. I was the first girl in Massachusetts to score a thousand points. And so everyone, so the everyone said that my mother threatened every one of my teammates that if they did not pass me the ball, she would bench them. Yeah, so that's how I got to score a thousand points. Was there some resentment on that team? Um, no, she was very she. My mother, do not she, lilac bush. She is. She ran a tight ship. She had six kids and lots of rules, and she was very strict. And so I would say she was probably harder on me than anybody. So 
No, I think may, my teammates may have felt sorry for me a little bit. I don't know that phrase, lilac bush. What does that mean? That means if you misbehave, you go out to the yard and pick your switch oh. off the lilac bush. And then you come in and she uses the switch on you. Like, Did I she... think that was common back in the 50s. Yeah. What's an example she, of something that would get you She would probably be switching. in trouble. <laughs> uh, talking back. Talking back. Actually, I'll be honest with you. I was a large Irish Catholic family. I'm a rule follower or I'm a people pleaser. So I really was the good little kid who went to mass every, not every Sunday, but every day with my mom. But I had brothers and sisters who were a little, as I used to think, a little on the wild side. And so they would get, they would do bad things. They would skip school. They would get caught making out behind the convent. They would get caught drinking. Was it that you did not do those things or just you didn't get caught? <laughs> did not do them. I did not drink in college. I, why? Because it's against the law. I am a rule, was, or I was a rule fall. I still am. But no, I drank the Catholic punch. I don't want to, you know, do something that you're not supposed to do. And then that's just, I was a naive, good little kid. Yeah, naive. Do you still go to mass? No, I do not. I actually, and I was so guilty about this. I asked my mother, um, some of the doctrines of the Catholic church don't work for me, like regarding, you know, gay and lesbian folks and um, divorced folks and, and the role of women in the Catholic church. And I mean, I could go on and on and on. I was in, at mass with my mother and the sermon was sort of bad towards gay people. And I was a coach and my best friends, you know, it was a highly gay community that I work in. And I'm like, I can't pretend to be a Catholic when this is what you're saying about my best friends. So I was in the car with my mother. I said, mom, I'm going to stop being a Catholic if that's okay with you. I had to, I had to ask her permission and I was 40 years old. So, and yeah. what did she say? But no, I, I'm, I'm religious. She said, Kathy, if I wasn't so old, I'd join you. Wow. She was angry about the, she was angry about the sermon. We were both angry about the sermon, you know, and it wasn't, and it was just that particular human being sharing his thoughts with us, but too many of the representatives of that, this is too heavy, Stuart, too many of them were represent doctrines that I could not believe and buy into, so. So where did your, what kind of a school did your mom coach in and what kind of a school did you first start coaching in? Well, we lived in a big house across the street from a little parish school called Sacred Heart beside the convent. So the nuns could see each and every one of us. I was the little kid who went out in the, in the basket. There was a basketball court across the street and I shot baskets all day um, while my brothers and sisters actually had a normal life. I, I just shot baskets. So, so it was good. By I yourself, scored a thousand points. You were alone? Uh, alone. Hours and hours and hours and hours of shooting baskets, yeah. So, and, and then I was, and I went to a Catholic school with nuns, grades one through 12, where we sat in the same room and the nuns rotated through the room. So, and I never had gym, never had a gym class or phys ed class in my life. And so when I was a senior and it was time to see, what do you want to be, Kathy? I'm like, we don't know where... Uh, the fact that I wanted to be a gym teacher, we didn't know where that came from. That was just very strange. And my mother had raised me to, you can be anything you want, Kathy. What would you like to do? I want to be a gym teacher. I love sports. Okay. Make no sense. That's, that's no great. Sense. Mm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Was your father around? Yes. My father was um, a lawyer, chief counselor at NASA, the space program. Yeah, we were just your typical, not in the, I grew up in the 50s and it was almost like a leave it to Beva kind of, although my mother was, a, they were both wonderful. I had a wonderful upbringing. I can't say enough about both my parents. They were unbelievable. My dad, I think was a genius and my mother was a saint. And my oldest sister was Down syndrome. And so my mother kept her at home for most of her life as well too. So my mother was quite remarkable. Oh, that's great. 
Is she yeah. still around or has she passed? No, she passed away um, in 1997, I believe, at age 79. And she, she gave me the lecture of, uh, I have lived the greatest life, don't you dare cry, Kathy, because I, I was the emotional child. And so she didn't, she doesn't like the emotion or the tears. And she was, I remember her pointing her finger at me. Don't you dare cry. I've had a great life. I have great children. It's time, you know? So she was just an inspiration, certainly to me. And I think to everybody who knew her. Were you able to not cry? Oh dear God, no, <laughs> no, it was. But but it was funny because my dad died when I was 21, suddenly, of lung cancer. At, he was 56. So it was way too young and way too sudden. And he was very stoic and didn't really let us know he had lung cancer. And so that was very hard. And so my mother and I had long discussions about, uh, I, I am a fan of prepared death. Like, so I read books about it. Don't ask me the names, I'll forget them. But I didn't want to be surprised ever again. So I wanted to talk about death. And so I got to do that with my mother. I think, you know, hers was a prognosis. We knew the end was coming. I spent a lot of time with her her last two months and, and it was prepared. It doesn't make it any easier, but I still would rather talk about it. I'm a talker. Have you talked to your son? Have you had the talk? with him at all about my no you <laughs> he won't let me <laughs> he will not let me yet have you tried <laughs> not kind of but he's he's uh he's a he's a gentle soul and so he he won't hear it he won't have it he thinks i'm gonna live forever because uh, i'm very healthy and you know like i'm actually very resilient so if i i mean i had breast cancer and oh my god so where are you all in the season? How this has been a weird season. Where where are you all? We are nowhere. We are we had no season. So me and my staff sort of creatively tried to keep we did two things. We were working a lot on relationships and leadership. Hard the leadership pieces we can just talk about it and practice sort of mental skills, but and then we're working on the mental game. So there's a lot of um, I'm a big believer that performance is about 80% mental. So if you know, you have to be able to maintain your confidence, relax, visualize, set affirmations. So there's a lot of tools, I think, you know, that if we train our minds as much as we train our bodies, then it shows up in your performance. So we, that's what we spent the year working on was that stuff. Is, is that proprietary? Are these top secret or can you share anything? No. What? No, they're all good. Like it starts with them. Um, I'm a big meditation is a lost, uh, you know, I think other countries do it better than we do. I think we're uh, the overworked, too busy, too much stimulation, don't know how to uh, not even have an awareness of your mind and your thoughts and all of that. And so I think meditation is a very, very healthy tool that we should use more in our country. And so we, a lot of it was meditation and breath control. And, and then it's um, self-talk, like so many kids. So Harvard kids try to be perfect. Perfect is boring. I always tell them perfect is really boring. And I was one of those kids. I, I wanted to have the prettiest hair and get straight A's and all that. And uh, like the sooner you can shed that nonsense, the better. Where did you go to undergrad? I went to Bridgewater State College in Bridgewater, Massachusetts which in 1967 was one of the strongest physical education schools around, definitely in the Northeast. And uh, I had never had a gym class because I went to parochial school and I don't, my mother did basketball after school as the coach. And that was all I, so I don't know what, I never saw field hockey, lacrosse, never played softball. I never did any of those things. And I went off to college and I was, traumatized by all these very athletic women that had that were good and I was a good swimmer and I could play basketball and that's it oh I could ice skate but so I was kind of traumatized in as a physical education major I was a fish out of water and I I call, I always tell this story forgive me if it's boring but I I called I was 45 minutes from where I grew up and I called home crying my eyes out and I said mom I gotta come home I don't belong here I'm so different and she said Kathy 
grow up. And then she hung the phone up on me. So, yeah. And everybody thinks that's so cruel, but it was like, it was the best thing she could have done for me. So, and I loved oh. Bridgewater. I, I learned I don't like field hockey, so I didn't really learn it, but I loved that. Just a small little New England college. I loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Yeah. Was your favorite coach in high school or in college? Or I guess it had to be your mom. <laughs> it has to be because she's the only coach I ever had. I never played sports. Like I am, I, we don't know why I'm the head coach at Harvard. It doesn't make any sense at all. I didn't play basketball. I played six player basketball for my mother that isn't really basketball and then I went to phys ed college again we don't really know why um and loved it and then I got a teaching job I'm a very good swimmer and so I started a swim program at Westwood High School in 1971 the year title nine passed and I'm a hard worker and so the superintendent said to me can you know, we have a terrible girls basketball team. Can you coach it and, and can you win? Because his daughter played. And I'm like, of course I can. Again, no one taught me. I mean, I was a phys ed teacher, so I, I know basketball. And so I just started reading books and I coached basketball and look where I ended up. Go figure. Well, how did you come to apply for the job? They invited me. I didn't want, uh, so if, ironically, my dad was a law professor at Boston College and Boston College and Harvard have this sort of, Crosstown rivalry. And I grew up thinking Harvard was not a good place. It was just like rich people and men. And, you know, uh, and, and in fact, my mother told me, I said, Mom, I'm applying for the Harvard job. She went dead silent on the phone. And, and then she used the Kathy, you're not like those people. And I'm like, what are those people like? But so I, they invited me to interview. And so I, didn't want the job, didn't prepare, borrowed a suit. Someone else wrote my resume for me because I didn't want the job. And I went over there just like thinking, I'll just go through this experience just to have a, an interview. And in one day's time, there's this energy at Harvard. There's this, I loved the people that were at Harvard. I was so ashamed that I didn't prepare because now I wanted the job. Yeah, it was a funny thing. I mean, I, I, I'm i not the role model for how to professionally develop yourself. Can you talk about that energy a little bit? And so they laughed at my jokes. I'm like, that's, that was the deal breaker. They laughed at my jokes. And then I met with each one personally. And um, I, I was very hyper aware of equity and Title IX and caring to do it the right way. And in the early 80s, there was so many people that weren't doing it right. They they convinced me that they cared about equity and they wanted to do it the right way. So I wanted the job. So when you started coaching at Harvard, you're not just coaching at a collegiate level. You're not just coaching in a sport that you had coached. It. You're coaching a sport you hadn't coached at Harvard in the <laughs> Ivy League. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. How did you learn i mean how did you stay why weren't you one and done yeah no i right well this is what we're trying to figure out this is why this is why there you know there's so many people in my life that were trying to convince me to write a book because um the story is odd because i again i coached high school for 11 years having never played and i my record was something like i don't even know what it was but it was like 211 and 20 or something like that. Like a 90% win rate. Correct. Why? We don't know why. We don't know why. Like, and I know what, I'm a hard worker. I read my basketball books. I love it. Like once I decide to do something, I'm doing it. Um, so I, I was clearly a fish out of water at the high school level as well, but had great success. And, and then now I'm at college. I'm really a fish out of water. I've never been an assistant coach ever. I never learned from anyone. I just got thrown into these environments and like had to furiously educate myself. And, you know, it's like, I tell all my athletes from the eighties, I'm like, you are my giant experiment. Like, I'm sorry, I apologize for all my mistakes on you. But like, so I think that my style of management and leadership is different, non-traditional. And that's 
maybe the story because I'm at Harvard. So it's basketball. And no, I never coached at the college level, but I have all these women that are brilliant. And so I can't, I can't play mind games on them. They can see right through me. Like there's no fooling them. They will call me out. And they're all at the pinnacle of their professions, like Attorney General Mara Healy, who's a political superstar, whether you like what she's doing or not, she's a superstar. And she played for me and she will tell you that, you know, there were some takeaways from being part of Harvard basketball. Like, so all these women that have these incredible careers say, well, I learned this by being a basketball player at Harvard. So that's, that's the story that's amazing. And because I was not traditional, I'm not, you know, everything I told you about myself is not very traditional. There's this phrase, relational leadership. I don't know what that means. That sounds like a Harvard business school kind of a thing. Tell me what that looks like. That's the million dollar question. How did I learn that? And I think it's just intrinsically who I am. I think relationships are the basis for everything in this world. There's more than one way to be a leader. And I think there needs to be Brene Brown. You don't read, but she has written a lot of books that are people are very drawn to. Have you read Brene? I've read many of them. Been to see her, taken one of her therapy sessions. So yeah, okay, huge she's, fan. I have a, I have a girl crush on her. I just because everything she writes and says validated how I've run my life. And again, I I felt criticized by that style of leadership. Like, I, 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 my players call me Kathy, and if you're uncomfortable with that, you can call me Coach Kathy. But like. Uh, that's just my my style. It works for me. I'm not saying it, ha- it works for everybody, but Brene validated what I had done my whole life. And so I, I'm a big believer in that vulnerability, accountability, what she professes. Uh, I'm a big believer in that. Well, in North Carolina, you know, Coach K and Dean Smith and now Roy Williams, they're these icons, they're these titans. But you also had like Bobby Knight, uh, you had the chair throwing, the, the actually striking players. I gather doesn't happen as much with women. Why is that? Stuart, that's a hard question. Um, uh, well, then I'm gonna tell you a story because, I, and I think I'm not a screamer. I'm kind of, I am relational. And I would say that just the feedback I get from all my alumni is they forget all the times I hurt them and they remember how much support I gave them. So, so that's a good thing. But like I had, my son was in the fifth grade, his whole fifth grade class came to my game. Uh, They all sat behind my bench and we were playing really poorly and I turned around and kicked a chair. So I've kicked a chair before. I just don't think women by their nature are, are that. I think, you know, women are from Venus and men are from Mars. I think there's some truth to that. So we're different. By the same token, are there some players, women, who respond, you need to be direct with them? Yeah. What's an example of something you would say to one player that you would never say to another player? So there's there's a documentary. One of my players went and did a documentary called Act As If, which is a mantra that I use a lot over my coaching career. And, um, she said to me, she was into me in a game and I'm grabbing one of my players screaming at the top of my lungs, get your head out of your ass. And so I could do that to this one little kid, but if I did that to another player, she would cry. I believe that sports is the best classroom we have in our system, Uh, elementary school, high school, college. That kid knows what I mean. When I say take your head out of your ass, I'm basically telling you to stop whining or sulking or worrying about your missed layup, which means get your head out of the game, stay in the moment and move forward instead of worrying about a mistake you made. And she knows that because you all have a relationship. You're not saying this out of the blue. You're not a stranger. Right. We know each other. And again, I and, and I don't I don't think all coaches are comfortable enough to, having relational leadership, like they would prefer some separation. They feel it garners respect. They feel it gives them more authority. I mean, and and as I said, when I was criticized for my style, people go, well, your players aren't going to respect you. 
And, and that's so inaccurate. That is so not true. Like, um, I, I think, I think you need, you need to work really hard on your relationship and, and giving them a safe environment and a feeling of trust. And then, then you can teach them anything and you can teach them in a hard way, in a soft way, using both. Like you, you can, you can make sport a class. So, you know, it's, we're not, we're not playing sports to bring just to, you know, bring money into it. It's a, it's way more than that in our system in this country. It's way more than just bringing the almighty dollar. And I hear you saying that you can learn things by this activity, by kind of a live fire exercise then you, that you really can't learn in a book, in the classroom, watching a video, don't, no matter who the best teacher is. It's a, it's, it's tactile learning. It's, it's a live fire exercise. Yeah. It's like, I'm working on my leadership today and the next day and the next day. It's, it's really, I mean, learn, like you, you pick the life skill. It's chemistry, it's converse, it's handling failure. It's, it's everything that you need in your life, in your family, in your corporation, in your, and that's why you'll see graduate schools and corporations, they recruit athletes, student athletes heavily, like I'm sure from everywhere, but from Harvard, like you go a notch higher. Medical schools want athletes, for example. It shows what they call a well-rounded individual. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And then there's also, you talked about the, the mental aspect in terms of um, inspirational envisioning, act as if, and also the breathing and the meditation. But there's also what I admire so much about you is uh, strategy. It's also a straight up analytical kind of a skill. How do you learn that and how do you convey it? Yeah, I, I think you asked another million dollar question, Stuart. And it's so funny. I, my impression of coaching peers is I have an impression that this coach is really, really good at that. So that when I'm playing against that coach, I'm worried about that coach's ability to change offenses or use strategy, you know, that I'm going to have to react to and adjust to. And I think some coaches are really, really good at it. And some coaches are not very good at it. I actually think I'm not the best, but I'm not the worst. Um, and I'm very challenged by, you know, creating a strategy for a game. Like, so for example, we, um, were the first 16 seed to beat a one seed in the NCAA tournament, men, women, or whatever. And we ironically did it against Stanford on their home court. That that's like climbing Mount Everest. That's like, they were the team of the decade and we were the underdog. And so it was really fun for me and my staff to create a strategy against them. Um, and I will honestly say that there was a lot of tactical X's and O's but it was a lot of the mental strategy and the mental approach going into that game that really allowed us to win. And I'm very challenged by that. I love that. Has anybody from the Harvard Business School or the Kennedy School ever said, hey, Kathy, we want you to teach. We want you to come over here. And... <laughs> um, yeah, funny. I, so these are some, this is here. You're, you're touching on a regret of mine. There was a um, psychology professor who is now deceased his name was Richard Hackman and he ran the psychology department at Harvard he he was so good at he wrote a book called team leadership I have this program in my in my basketball program where we my players invite their professors to be an honorary coach and an honorary coach gets to come in the locker room hear my pregame speech sit on the bench during the game come into my locker room at halftime and post game which a lot of coaches don't allow that because, you know, crazy things can go on in the locker room. So I remember the first time Richard, his name was Richard Hackman. I, he came in and he sat in his chair with a clipboard and he just wrote furiously. And I was aware of him doing that. And as the head of psychology, I found it a little intimidating, but I get so into my coaching that I forgot about him. 
after the season, he, we, he invited me out to lunch and we, he read some things to me and I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. He goes, that was your pregame speech. That was your halftime speech. And so then we started to discuss leadership and, and my strategies and techniques. And he was, I will tell you, very, very big fan of mine. And he would, he said, I'm chapter six in his, his leadership book. He just thought that my leadership was what he wanted to teach. So he kept trying to get me to come and be in his class. So his classes were like, you know, hundreds of kids in like a, he was on a stage and he was doing his thing. And I was always, he kept wanting me to go. And he goes, well, just talk, Kathy, just question and answers. And which is what we did at lunch. I mean, we, we had a great relationship and we would talk about leadership all the time. He came to every single game. He was an honorary coach for like 11 or 12 years. And I never took him up on going to his class because I was intimidated by that. Isn't that a shame? What a lost opportunity. Then someone from the Harvard Business School wanted to do a case study because that's how people, they, they use case studies. So we were halfway through developing a case study based on my leadership. And something unfortunate happened that I can't really speak about. That, that came to a halt. Coupled with, I didn't really have a ha, an aha moment. Like, so the case study, I guess at the end has to have the aha moment according to HBS. What do they long, know? Well, yeah. I mean, long seriously, seriously. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, but I'm so non-traditional, Stuart. You know, I, I'm not, you know, uh, so it's so funny when I, I'm on a panel and the panel is, you know, composed of very poised, very eloquent speakers. That's just not my style at all. I'm, you know, I mix my words up. I sometimes are a little, you know, there's no filter attached to me. I get myself in a little trouble here and there. So, so I'm always aware of my, and I, and I'm not going to change. It, it is who I am. And it is my style, but it's very different than, you know, prepared, eloquent speakers, you know. But I mean, the, they say it's not bragging if it's just facts. You are the winningest women's basketball coach in the history of the Ivy League. Is this correct? Uh, yeah, well, no, even, you know what, Stuart, thank you. I'm going to brag because I just found this out about myself. I thought that was what I was, the winningest basketball coach in the Ivy League. I am the winningest coach, all sports, men or women, in the Ivy League. I didn't know that till this year. Like, and I'm like, Wow. I am impressed with that. And it's because I've been at Harvard 40 years. Who stays anywhere 40 years? And I, I'm not making excuses because it's a great accomplishment. No one's ever going to break that record. Well, Except for coaches, me. I keep... coaches get bounced all the time. It's not just that you were like, eh, I guess I'll hang around and be a lifer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, sure. Come on. I mean, holy <laughs> cow. That's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I just have to say it. If you were a man, uh -huh. you would yeah. be, you know, Dean Smith, you would be Coach K. And so thank God you're writing this book. Oh, thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Dean Smith had a system and he recruited players to fill slots in that system. Yes. And, and Coach K recruited the best players he could find and built a system to, to, to accommodate the strengths of that group of five. Yes, um, true. What does Kathy do? So that's been a topic of discussion. The method that I'm writing the book, it's called Lunch with Kathy. So I, I sit down and uh, Zoom two of my alumni and we just, I just talk to them about, you know, what did you learn? What did it mean? I, I asked all of them, should I write a book? Because I, you know, I, I did drag my feet and didn't want to write the book. What has come out very, oh, like so strong for me is um, the relationships that all of my players had with 
the coaches, with each other, and with those that came before them and those that come from behind. And they, they decided that in their wisdom, they decided that I know how to pick really good people. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, that's really attaching way too much credit to me. But there may be some truth to that. Like I will pass on a star to take a blue collar worker, someone that I know can mold into the team chemistry that I'm looking for. You know, the, the famous overused, there's no I in team. Like, but that's true. Like, and I, you know, I, my beloved Celtics, and I think they, they're battling some of that, those issues right now because there's, there's too many of them that care about their own stats. So I do think that I must have good instincts in picking people as well as basketball players because, and, and then we work hard. I mean, I, I'm going to say like kids at age 16, 17, 18, don't come to a college and get put on a team and have instant chemistry. They have to work at their relationships. And so, and again, I think it starts at the top. So I think the culture that's at Harvard that these women are experiencing and benefiting from and loving like it's hard work by me and by my coaching staff for sure. And, and then I have to teach my captains how to lead and help them, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of hard work. It does. Now there are some men's sports and they just recruit superstars and they roll the ball out and the superstars can get it done. And again, that's a little more short term than a coach who wants to do more than that. Are, are women less likely to, be this sort of team of one in their own mind, the sort of give me the ball, give me the ball? Well, again, I think it's Mars and Venus. I think we're different. I think uh, how many women like me and like our people pleasers and rule followers, like and guys, they just go out and get into trouble. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's, it's the nature of the gender. And again, I'm not educated enough or well-read enough to tell you why that is. I think the, the male ego is just more, just way stronger than the female ego. And I, and I, you know, that's my challenge. That was probably number one challenge for me is to empower the girls and the women that I coach to have an ego, to have confidence and not arrogance, but confidence. And I, and we still struggle and it, it has to do with body image and it has to do with our culture in, the, in America, how we treat women and what you look at in magazines and on TVs and who we're, who we think we have to be and who we think we have to, what we have to look like. And I don't think men have the same, they have different challenges. Men have very different challenges than that. That's more of a problem in men's sports is getting them to listen to the coach and be coached because they care about, and social media, as you know, Stuart, has made it way worse. I, I am going there. I am asking about the difference in nature and nurture. And I'm also asking about the distinction between sex and gender. What have you been able to see, especially in the last, like, let's say 10 years, the last quarter of your coaching at Harvard in this huge discussion about gender. I mean, my kids are millennials and I have one who's technically a Gen Z and they are forever saying to me that gender is a construct. And I am forever saying to them, a penis is not a construct. You know, testosterone is not a construct. Estrogen is not a construct. What I'm wondering is, what do you make of all of that? What have you been able to observe about the way um, young women sort of come to their identities since it's such a big part of how they play the game. Yeah. Stuart, you're asking the great questions, really, because my entire life, well, when I was a high school coach, I would, again, I would form a very close relationship with my players. And when they graduated and went off to college, college is, is arguably the start of your sexual identity. And there are so many variables that, or roads you can go down. And I would have these young women who were not prepared for all that they were seeing and experiencing in college, everything from losing their virginity to am I gay, am I not gay, what's my label, do I want a label, all that stuff. Without, you know, there's more conversation and education about it now, but 
for me on a simple level as a high school coach, these kids would call me and say, this woman tried to pick me up and I'm traumatized by this. And it's like, okay, well, I don't know that I had that course at Bridgewater. I, no one's really <laughs> teaching me how to counsel you, but I was very, very aware that this was a, in my opinion, a huge bump in the road for women at, and at the college level. And I, in my own head, I said, if I ever become a college coach, I am not going to have homophobia on my team. I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to be very transparent. We're going to have conversations. We're going to have education. We're going to, we're going to let everybody be free to be whoever they are, whether that means sleeping around with the football team or being gay or something in between. And so I have truly tried to do that for my entire career. Now, selfishly, I did it because if I don't address it, it has a huge impact on performance. I have said on many a panel that one of the biggest problems or impediments to performance is choosing your sexual identity, is your lo losing your virginity, is that whole sexual assault. Those things are have never been talked about and they are epidemic at the co at colleges because that's where alcohol is most and that's where drugs are and that they are unfortunately all in tied together so uh, i i have always tried and my joke is and i've never liked roles i i don't think women ha are more suited to do this role necessarily and men more suited to do this role i'm like i've always told my family, told my husband, who's in my ex-husband now, all my friends, you know, let's live in a gender-free society. How about you pick what you like to do, I pick what I like to do, and then we buck up for the rest. Not, not I'm a woman, you should be home cooking dinner, and you're a man, you should be out bringing in the money. I'm just, that's just not who I am, and that's not the world I want to live in. I went off on a tangent, Stuart. I'm that sorry. That is about the that is that's one of the more thoughtful answers I've heard. <laughs> you know, I mean, clearly you have you have something better than expertise. You have experience. You know, that's better than a PhD. Uh, and your well, ability we'll to be there. I, I I would love to write a book and tell all these stories about like conversations I had with someone that you know was sleeping around too much, and I I wanted to I didn't necessarily want to tell her to not sleep around, but I wanted, you know, I wanted her to do it right. I wanted her to, you know, <laughs> I, I, I had a woman who, who want, who just felt the need to describe her first lesbian kiss with me. Like, well, I have no interest in that, but she needed me to hear it. So there you go. And so like, and I keep thinking, I don't, I, I just went to a physical education college. That's, that's, that's all I did. So it's, it's so unusual that, I'm caught in the environments that I'm caught in and just, you know, put, try, trying to make decisions and do the right things. Lots of them are right. Lots of them are wrong. Well, how did you hear her out? Not just cut her off. How did you not just say, I don't want to hear it. I'm not, I don't get paid to hear that. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. I let her, I, and I go, you know, so-and-so I'm, I, if, if you're happy, I'm happy. Thanks for sharing. Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> what else can you do i don't even like pda of any i don't you know i don't want to sit in a room while everyone's making out and you know honestly when i first went to harvard there was a gay woman there and and i was married at the time and i have a hyphenated name so everybody knew i was married and they they all uh, i was invited into a dinner where a, a lot of these gay women were draped over one another and i and it was just my test to see if one, how I was going to handle it, and am I gay? And I said, I, my player who invited me there, I took her out for a little private conversation, and I said, you know what? Tell your friends I'm not gay. Tell them that if they need to have that PDA, I will provide them a nice spot where they can go do it privately, but I'm not interested in that scene. Like, so, uh, and again, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't take a course to come up with that answer necessarily. I was kind of shocked. So a lot of what I experienced, you know, along the way is just using my instincts and my gut to create the culture and the environment that I wanted, which truly is free to be you, whoever you is. Like that's, that's, that's what I want. Does anyone, do they look at you as 
is it a professional it's obviously a personal relationship too but do they look at you as sister as mom as friend as none of the above i mean what is does it vary by person yeah probably uh, is uh, i think the big joke between me and my coaching friends is we just wear a million hats i would say i'm uh, because i'm so old i'm probably a mom and i could easily be a grandma right now because <laughs> I'm not that sharp, Stuart. You know, like, I think I'm, you know, when I don't understand Twitter or Instagram or any of that stuff, and I, or I, I'm slow on the uptake with the joke, I just, I'll pretend, like, act as if is what I do. So I'll just pretend. And then I'll run to my young assistant and say, I don't get it. Can you explain that to me? And so, so you know, I think a lot of it is endearing to my players that I'm, I'm probably still have a whole naive side to me. Um, just cause that's how I was raised and that's who I am. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes if, if people remind you of their mother, that's not a good thing. <laughs> you know, <so. laughs> that's correct. That is absolutely, I do not want to be your mother. You don't like your mother right now. You're 19 years old. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 But by the same time you are, um, uh, by virtue of you are the coach they're not going to coach themselves um you you have a role and you bring a value to the game uh and that role is as by definition an authority figure yes yeah i would say friend i'm not i, I don't want to be their friend i actually you know want to make sure that I'm disciplining them enough or that I'm tough enough on them. And then if it's hard for them, then I want my younger assistant coaches to like give the hug and pick up the pieces. Um, I still do it because that's who I am intrinsically, but I would say a lot of head coaches, that wouldn't be the right model for them. I've gotten away with it. So I'm, you know, if it's not broke, don't, don't fix it. So that's, I'll finish my twilight years with, you know going the way i go but uh i i don't seek out to be their friend i've had a player you know where we fought and she told me she didn't like basketball and we fought and i said well okay fine fine leave the team and well we i challenged her and uh she was so angry with me she went out and played the best basketball her of her life we won an ivy title because of her and then she stopped playing she didn't play her senior year but i thought that was great coaching on my part uh, that i that i you know triggered this anger in her to get her to play at the level she played at and again that that's good coaching and there was no fourth thought to that it was just instinct probably more than anything harvard being harvard i'm sure you have staff members who just regurgitate innumerable stats left-handed players at the foul line on a tuesday yeah. uh, i mean do, do you pay any attention to these reams of numbers uh, yeah we all have the technology where we're all you know this combinations and quality points given to certain combinations and how many did you get in the game and all that um ironically i went to a conference by brad stevens in the celtics and they invite a couple of the local coaches in the area to go and one of the sessions was on like the overuse of analytics and all of that and their takeaway although they're not doing that well this year so i don't know what to make of that but they said instincts are still better than analytics so use your instincts first and i still agree with that do women get fewer fouls than men fewer fouls no way more is there a different standard for what constitutes a foul in the women's yes. game yes infuriatingly the answer is yes like and there's even it, i mean the games are pretty close to identical but there's a a few nuances like um the hand check so if someone's dribbling the ball you can't basically you can't even touch them you can do what's called a hot stove touch which is just like a a, a check but if you leave your hand there, no matter how gentle it is, it's a foul. And that's how the rule is written. I believe it's, I think it's even true for the men's game, but they just call it in the women's game one million times more. And it ruins the game. The same with travel. Like um, there's such an advantage to 
some of the traveling that they let go in the men's NCAA. How about straight up fights? Swing and mm, no, hand. no. Women, again, Mars and Venus, the, the women are, are not prone to fighting like men at all. Again, I think it's just the nature. Uh, we just don't, that's, that's not um, who we are mostly. How about ejections? You get tossed? You ever get tossed? Did I ever get tossed? No, I want to. I tried to. I've only had one technical fall in 50 years. And I tried for? A technical fall is like swearing. I know, I know what it <laughs> oh. what was what was yours for? <laughs> oh, I think I said nice call. Yeah. And it was a, it was a, I'm sorry, it was Amanda Fisher. All right, I it could have been screaming at it and I could have been parading up and down the sideline and I thought. That's a really nice call, and he teed me up. And it was like three minutes left in the in a basketball game where we were getting beat by forty. It was a it was a fragile male official eagle. It was really stupid. He looked stupid calling it on me because I I don't there was no even swear attached to it. It was very silly. So I've never you say you tried him. to get tossed. Yeah, I remember once I tried. I I sweared, and this was a, an official who had a thick skin and he wasn't going to throw me out. He threw me a technical. Well, he gave me a technical and then I tried to get thrown out, but he was too chicken to throw me out. I, at least that was my impression at the time. That was 25 years, 20 years well, ago. Why did you want to get thrown out? Because we were losing. <laughs> no, because I wanted, yeah, I wanted my team to react to something and that would have been quite unusual that I was thrown out. So, um, But you've yeah. never kicked a chair in the Ivy League. No, it was against Providence. I remember it because my son was so mad at me for kicking the chair. Because I, again, I'm not a screamer. I'm, I'm a pretty nice coach. People say to me, "Um, you have very nice, controlled manner." People, I, I will tell you readily, and my opponents will tell you the same thing. I don't work officials very well. Like, and there are coaches that's an art, and I, I don't have it. And I, but I think my voice is too low and my no, uh, my face is too sharp and people just I, I don't know I just it doesn't work when I try to work the officials it doesn't work so I'm not good at it yeah and they get the calls those guys who can yes, do it they, they, they get do. the calls yes they do they do it because it works <laughs> how much are you a uh, kind of a performer you're like putting on a persona for the benefit of your team and the refs or even for the fans. Yeah. There are coaches who do that. And I am not one of them. I don't even like it. I, it. It's not about you, me. It's not about the coach. It's about the game. And it infuriates me when, like, I mean, I could name, she was in the final four. And, well, there's a number of them. There's a number of them on the women's side. They feel it's about them. And it's a big show. I don't care for that at all. That's not me. I don't sit, but I don't parade, and I don't, I don't put on a show. I don't like it that at all. I would say my coaching philosophy is I'm preparing you to play the game, and so you have to be out on the court making split decisions on your own. So in a practice, for example, um, there will be like a, a decision that has to be made, and I don't help them with it in practice. I'll talk to them after they made the decision. I'll say that was right, that was wrong. And so I'm teaching them to make their own decisions. So for example, you don't have, you're not gonna know what this means to it, but when I'm teaching zone defense, for example, there's a lot of gray areas, there's a lot of decisions and there's no necessarily right, it's not a science. And so my players, especially Harvard players have 1 million questions and I'm like, I'm not answering any questions because in a game you're going to have these same decisions and you're going to have to live and die with what your decisions are and i'm going to teach you after you make the decision in practice and tell you if it's right or if it's wrong and that's how you're going to learn to make the right decisions and and so that's what happens in a game they they play the game they have to play the game i, I there are coaches that micromanage and call every offense and have all these hand signals. And, you know, I think they're doing a disservice to their players. I do. You have to, obviously you want to praise 
players for jobs well done. But if someone's being selfish, they're just they're being a taker. How do you punish that person? Yeah, well, that again, that training takes place before they even get in a game. So we have uh, we used to call them rules. I don't like having a lot of rules. We call them guidelines. And 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 everyone who hasn't had this in their life before they come to Harvard are maybe shocked by it. But things like the discipline of when you come in my building, the gym, your locker room, you have to turn your phone in. You can't you can't be on your phone. You can't be on social media. You can't, you turn your phone in. And when you leave, you can't yawn in practice. You must give eye contact to whomever is speaking. You cannot bend over at the waist. You can't, you can't show me fatigue. So you have to watch your facial expressions. You have to be aware of your body language. You have to sprint and pick up a teammate. So there's a whole set of cultural things expectations that are in place and so if they're not in place in a game i will pull you out of the game immediately for that not for missing a basket or not for making a mistake but for a facial expression or a uh ten temper tantrum or as anything that's selfish that goes against the culture that we work hard on in practice i'll just pull you out i once was talking to a woman who was um worked for the city of New York in trying to encourage kids to continue to participate in physical education. But there's this huge group of people that I think feel left out. Mm -hmm. How do we pick up those people and encourage them to continue to play team sports? Yeah. You know what, Stuart, we are on the same page because that is the heartbreaking reality of our sports world in this country. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. And so it's like, why do you play sports? Do you play sports to be a superstar? Do you play sports to get into college? I have worked with the youth basketball organizations in my town and given talks to all these youth sport AAU, not not a, even AAU, but youth sport coaches, you know, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. And they're trying to specialize and so soccer being at the top of the list single-handedly destroyed little league in my state because they were having travel teams and um there was nobody left over to play little league and i mean and so and everyone's doing it to become a superstar instead of playing to have fun it's heart-wrenching to me and i will tell you i'm sad i don't have an answer for you um i did a leadership talk at um, harvard where Radcliffe was handpicking 30 women leaders to be part of an intense one week leadership program. And I was one of the speakers one of the days regarding sports. And I walked into this room of 30 brilliant women. And I said, all right, how many of you have ever played a sport? And this is now they're in college now, none of them, zero. There was not one athlete. And so we had a discussion about why, and it's just what you said, Stuart. It's like, well, I don't, I'm, you know, everybody's such a star and I'm not as good. And, you know, they weren't even going into weight rooms in their towns and they weren't going into their gyms because they weren't as good and they were intimidated by the, the environment, the culture of like, you have to be a star to enjoy the sport. I mean, I opened up my gym and I said, you guys got to come down. You have to, you can just, you can dribble off your foot. You just have fun jump roping or shooting a basketball or throwing a frisbee or whatever it is like we got to get back to playing sports for the right reason and we're not doing that anymore and it's the parents who are to blame and and the coaches so i don't have an answer for you Stuart. i'm very sad about it but it's getting worse not better and kids are specializing too young and it's causing injuries and i have told all my recruits play three sports don't specialize till you come to harvard like you'll be a better basketball player and you know what play for fun play because you love it don't play to get into college or to get a scholarship you probably know how your obituary would read if god forbid you got struck by <laughs> lightning today you probably know you know it's you know the winning <laughs> the winningest coach you never heard of um yeah, yeah. oh that's but, a good title for the book i like that you're welcome to it please okay, take you. it Thank you. Um, it's going to be the title of this podcast, The Winningest Coach You Never Heard Of. What I'm wondering is, who would you want to speak 
at at your memorial and what do you want them to say? Well, you might be surprised. I, I don't love being in the limelight, even though I'm loud and I talk a lot and I give everyone the impression that I have enormous confidence. Um, I do, but I haven't always had that. And so I just, all I want on a daily basis is to make a difference in someone's life. Like I am so motivated by, again, equity and empowering women and girls like that when I retire, I want to go to Rwanda and, and do some volunteer work for, you know, girls that have a different situation. I just, I, I don't want, I don't want a lot of money. I don't want a lot of awards necessarily, although I really don't handle losing very well. So I'm intensely competitive. But the most important thing to me is if I were coaching and we had a season is have a good practice today. It just lifts me. On, I'm on top of the world. If I come out of a practice and when we had a good one, that it's just really funny. So, so make a difference. I, Kathy made a difference. That's all I want. You have been so kind and you inspire me. And you are so good to make all this time. And I wish you nothing but the best with the book. You've got to come back when the book comes out. Okay, sure will. I'm going to hold you to that. All right, that's great. You, you're wonderful. You're everything Laura and Ann told me you were. Thank you very much, Kathy. All right, thank you, Stuart. Kathy was in at her son's house in Provincetown. And we talked via Zoom, which accounts for some of the audio that you heard. But holy cow, what a message. I cannot wait for this book. I mean, if you thought like Tuesdays with Mario or something, what about this book? And the, the, the amount of leadership in corporate America, political America, you know, all over the place. She is just a font of wisdom. I can't tell you how grateful I am for the time she spent. Thanks so much. Man Listening is a production of Unmediated LLC in cooperation with the Queen City Podcast Network and Balto Creative Media. Allison Andrews at Andrews Creative and Rachel Clapp Miller are developmental producers. Sally Higgins at Higgins and Owens tries to keep us legal. Our music is A Day at the Park by the group Pictures of the Floating World. Your announcer is Catherine Smith. That's me. Please go to our Patreon page. You'll find us at patreon.com. Look for Man Listening, one word, no spaces. We hope you'll join us by becoming a member. A small investment can raise up the conversation. If you want exclusive member merch, like a t-shirt, we can arrange that too. I'd like to thank everyone who has supported Man Listening from the very beginning, from the bottom of my heart. I cannot thank you enough. Don't forget to support us at Patreon. We believe one voice can change the conversation. Click the subscribe button and next week you'll hear. I think a really good boundary to have in relationship is not telling people what to do with their lives. That's next week on Man Listening. Thanks.